Greetings, everyone. Again, for our third of the midweek uh, Lenten reflections uh, during this season, uh, we are doing the, the service of noon prayer that you can follow along on the screen with as well. This will include some prayers, uh, some readings, and some reflections on uh, the Episcopal, which is the second reading uh, from this last Sunday, this one being from the first letter of Paul to the church in Corinth, or, the, or also known as 1 Corinthians. Uh, we can begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and when I say those words, we can also do the sign of our cross, the, of the cross, to remember our baptism. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the versicles. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares to the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Together, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our psalm today is uh, verses from Psalm 38, uh, beginning with the 11th verse. And again, I will pause if you prefer to, to do this in a more responsive way. My friends and companions, stand aloof from my plague. My nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and malice and treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man I do not hear, like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, and in those whose mouth are no rebukes. As for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O my Lord, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin. But my foes are vigorous, and they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Again, our reflection today is from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Um, and here he's starting, sorry, he started this letter off with, this, with thanksgiving, but then he goes quickly into divisions in the church. And it's not unlike the psalm where there's these divisions in the world. The psalmist talks about divisions between him and his adversaries. But here we see specifically divisions in the church, right? And, and as we look, as we've been going through this Lenten series on this whole, whole idea of covenants, especially the Old Testament covenants, um, and then today, in this last Sunday, a couple days ago, we, we started looking at a, a different covenant. We're going to spend two weeks on this covenant with Moses and, and with the people of Israel. Instead of being one way, it's two way. And anytime you have a two way covenant, there's, there's reason for, con there, there's a, a potential for conflict. And we're going to see throughout that, that the Jewish people, the, 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 who became the Jewish people, the, the, the nation of Israel, the, the Israelites, the, the descendants of, of, of the man Jacob, who also became known, known as Israel, kind of become very conflicted. And, they, and, they, and, they, and part of their whole covenant with God, as we see in the Ten Commandments, is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the, the second half of the of the tablets or the cover or, or what we call commandments four for ten are all about how to live in peace amongst each other how to treat your neighbor properly 
And yet we see from the very beginning that, that this is a struggle. And so it shouldn't surprise us that um, even a, just a few decades into this thing we call the church, right? The followers of Jesus, the, the followers of the way, that Paul's already writing this church in this city of Corinth, and there's conflict. There, there's conflict, there's divisions, the church isn't getting along, they're having probably, like, you might experience, like, what's the worst thing you can imagine happening in a church, right? Three-hour council meetings, you know, things like, you know, um, just not being able to agree on anything and, and not being able to, to come together with a, with a single focus, uh, arguing over things that really aren't about what we should argue about, those kinds of things. And, and, I, and I feel very blessed that Bethel's not in that place right now, that we have our divisions, we have our differences, we have disagreements, but I feel like those things are not preventing us from doing the mission that God has led us to. So in response, is, is he setting the tone for this whole letter that he's going to deal with these divisions that are happening in this church, he appeals to them about what makes one wise. What, what is wisdom and what does it mean to be wise in the world? What does it mean to be wise in Christ? And he really, in all of this, is really trying to, to, to bring us to this, this idea that what we think of as wisdom and what we think of as smart or what we think of as as sophisticated or, or whatever, often gets in the way of seeing what he's going to call the foolishness of the gospel. And it's foolishness in a lot of ways in the eyes of the world to do what we do as a church. It's foolishness in a way to, to think that somehow, you know, that the things that we teach as a church, that the, even the, the Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection and all, all these things, the way we orient our lives around this person and, the, and his teachings can all be things that, that are seen foolish. And yet, as we're going to see here, Paul actually says, in order to follow Jesus, you have to accept the things that seem foolish as wise. So we read our text from 1 Corinthians, uh, first chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. But those who are being called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolishness in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring nothing things that are, are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom of God, wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. So let's reflect on this for a minute. Again, Paul is, is kind of used in this rhetoric, this, this, and he was a, a well-trained man. He would have been considered wise and in a sense he would be considered well studied as a as a zealous you know pharisee and, and he was definitely a guy that could hang with the the greatest of the of the greek teachers and stoics and, and and philosophers of his age and yet he's kind of putting that all aside here and saying actually what what seems wise again to the world what seems wise to people that aren't following jesus actually is 
foolishness. And then what, what, what those that aren't following Jesus or, or aren't following the ways of, of God see as foolishness, that's actually the wise. So he starts by saying this is folly, right? It, it's, it's foolishness. But he goes, to those who are being saved, it's actually the power of God. So the thing that we put our, our whole faith system on, our whole way of viewing the world, the cross, that a man, Jesus, who was also God, became one of us and died on a cross, for a lot of people in the world, maybe even for a majority of the people in the world, that is simply foolishness. Why would you believe something like that? And yet, Paul says here, this is fulfilling actually this prophecy where it says, where God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So, and then he gets into this, okay, who is wise? Or where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? And he's saying, yet those that think they're wise will never know God through wisdom. So it's not that gaining more knowledge or even being able to discern that knowledge or being able to apply that knowledge, which is the kind of the definition of wisdom, you can gather all the knowledge in the world. You can discern all that knowledge. You can be able to break down really complex thoughts. Um, you know, in the history of the world, there's these, been these times where people that were, were gathered together, like the brightest minds of their day, to, to do a project. You know, if you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, which came out a few months ago, about the Manhattan Project. And they literally gathered the greatest scientists, the greatest physicists, the greatest, and they all gathered in these different regional hubs and then eventually in this little place, this little, which became a town, was nothing in Los Alamos in New Mexico. And they, they brought all these greatest minds together to focus on one thing. That's just one example of that in the history of the world where, where we bring all these great minds together and yet he goes, all these great minds together if all they're relying on is their wisdom, they're going to miss it. And then he contrasts this with the Jewish people. He says the Jewish people demand signs. They want proof. They want evidence. And then that's what Jesus went up against all the time. He goes, well, show us a sign. And then he would show them a sign. He would heal someone. He would cast out a demon. He would turn water into wine. He would multiply bread or whatever. And they would say, okay, well, show us another sign. They just keep demanding another sign after another sign after another sign. And then the Greeks, right, the philosophers are saying, we want wisdom, right? Show us wisdom. Show us proof. Show us and make an intellectual argument for Jesus. But he says, to those that are called to, to, to follow Jesus, whether you're Jewish or Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the proof, the, the sign, Jesus himself is the sign. If you're looking for a sign and you see the cross and you see the, 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 the word of God or hear the word of God and you hear the teaching of Jesus and, you, and, you, and you're exposed to, to, to who Jesus is, that, that is the sign and that is the source of wisdom. And if you don't, understand Jesus as the sign, right, then, then you're, you're missing the whole point. On Sunday, we talked about the Ten Commandments, right? We talked about the Ten Commandments as the sign, right, of the covenant God had made with, with the people of Israel, right? You know, a, a promise to make them a royal priesthood, this great nation, this, this people that were going to be not only a, a sign to themselves, but a sign to the, to the whole world. So God's like, how many times have I got to give you a sign? And now that I've given you the ultimate sign, you're looking right past it, right? So the thing that, that is supposed to be the sign, that is the very sign, the, also the object of that sign, the object of wisdom, right, of, of Jesus. We're talking about the Ten Commandments being way, way away of orienting our lives. Not, not as a way of a path to heaven, but a path to better live here on earth, to, to, to better live in response to, to what God has done for us and to share that, that being made right with God with each other, that the, the, ten, the Ten Commandments help us do that. But uh, even that can be, can be reduced to 
foolishness. People can say, well, why would I want to follow these rules? Or why would I want to do these things? So all of this, he boils down to this idea that God, the foolishness of God, the things that if God were to act in foolishness, and if God were to act in weakness, right? So they would say, well, if God can't give us a sign, right, he's weak. If God can't give us wisdom, he's a fool. And they said, the, the weakest God can, can present himself, and the most foolish that God can present himself is still wiser and stronger than anything in the world. And we see the power of that in the resurrection, right? Jesus became the weakest of weak humans on a cross, and yet came back stronger than any human has ever been. And then he personalizes this. So he gives this as a general idea. And then he personalizes this, you know, saying brothers, but I mean brothers and sisters, you know, brethren, whatever. The idea that, what about all of you? What about all of you that have been called into the faith? Where were you when God first called you? And he says, you know, you weren't powerful. Most of you were not of noble birth. Most of you didn't have great standing in the world. And yet God chose you, right? God chose the things that, that might have seemed foolish or might have seemed insignificant in the world and made them great. And that's one of the things we see throughout the story of the covenants, right? Like Abraham, who was Abraham? He was nobody special until God called him. Who was Noah? I mean, Noah was, was the one person in the, in the world that, that was kind of following God in his time. But it wasn't until God gave him, called him and gave him something special to do that he became someone special and significant. And then Moses too, right? Moses had fled had fled everything. He had run away. He, had, he thought he was starting all over. And he had done some, some, a very foolish act. He'd shown his power, but shown it in a very foolish way by killing an Egyptian soldier. And he had to run away. And yet God called him. And, and, then he, and when God calls him, he says, well, I'm not a very good speaker. And he gives all these reasons why he shouldn't have to do this task of freeing God's people. And God says, look, it's not about you. It's about me. It's not about your strength. It's not about your wisdom. It's about me. And, and so the, the idea that we see throughout the covenants that God doesn't use always the person that we would expect to use. He uses the person that he calls. And that person is often seen as weak or foolish in the world. And he says he does this for, for this reason. So that no one, no humans may boast in the presence of God. God calls us in our weakness. God calls us out of our weakness and out of our foolishness so that we can never say we did it ourselves. We can never boast to God and say, look what I did for you, God. And God's going to say, like, God's going to reply to that, you didn't do anything for me. Look what I did for you. Now, you may, we may respond in faith, and we see that in Abraham, but that's all we do. All the ability to do that is from God. And all, all the... Um, even uh, ability to understand what God's asking us to do, to receive that wisdom is from God. And he does that so that we will stay humble, that we will not boast. And then he concludes with this. He brings everything back to the cross. And that's important. When we talk about the covenants from the Old Testament, the covenants from the Old Testament are pointing to Christ, right? And then Paul writes, and he's pointing back to Christ. But everything's centered on who Jesus is. This is the, the focal point of our faith. And he says this, he says, because of him, you are in Christ, right? Who became to us wisdom from God. The very wisdom of God. That's why we talk about this being the word of God, but more importantly, being the, the Jesus is the word of God, right? Because the wisdom of the word, the wisdom of God comes from Jesus. He says, who became for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption all things the wisdom the being right with god the the sanctification that the learning to lit to, to that, that our faith is lived out and, and being made that god is making us holy and then finally that he is redeeming he's taken all things that were broken all things that were were fallen apart all things that were we're wrong in the world, and, and that brings us always back to the Moses covenant, right? Back to the Ten Commandments. We look at the Ten Commandments, and we say we, we, we failed. We, we don't follow them perfectly. We look at the whole nation of Israel, ignored the Ten Commandments, or, 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 or so blatantly didn't follow them that they eventually were destroyed. They were eventually 
that their nation was destroyed, their, their, their capital was destroyed, their temple was destroyed, and all those things. And yet God is saying, I'm going to bring all these things back together with him on the throne. That, that the whole work of God is this redemptive work. And that's why the covenants are so important because they remind us that, again, as we're saying each week, that when we aren't faithful, when we aren't to holding up our end of the bargain, when we rely on our own wisdom and our own strength instead of the wisdom and strength that comes from God, he still is faithful on his end. And again, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Where do we get to brag? On nothing we do. Where do we get to, to toot our own horn or whatever? Where do we get to, to make it about us? We never do. We always have to point it back to Jesus. And that's the important thing in this, is that we remember that because God has made the things of this world that seem weak and foolishness actually strong and wise, then we have no need to boast in that. We only boast in Christ. And anything God that does through us or for us, anytime he uses us to do something that, that, that seems extraordinary or that this, this seems to make a positive influence on others in the world, we always point that back to Jesus because the wisdom and the strength that we need comes not from us and not from this world, but from Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> we continue with the response. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray together the prayer our, our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We take a moment to pray for ourselves and to pray for others. I invite you as you're praying along with me and, and even in our moment of silence that you start with it, praying God, pr bringing to God the things that you are thankful for and offering your thanksgivings to him. And then we go into the petitions. And we, th this week we especially are, are focused on the youth that are going to be leaving for their retreat this, this, this coming Sunday. Uh, this coming week, which will be spring break, which will be a nice break for our teachers and our students and our families. And we also lift up the Academy 4 group that's going to meet this Friday um, and for the, for the last time before spring break. And we know that's something that our fourth graders especially look for. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you today mindful that even though the wisdom that we need comes from you and, and that the, the strength that we need comes from you, we often rely on our own wisdom. We often rely on our own strength. So, Lord, we thank you for bringing wisdom to us, bringing your strength and showing us that strength and the death and resurrection of your son. And as you are working to redeem all things back to you, we thank you, Lord, for our youth and the opportunity they have this, this coming week to, to be on retreat. We thank you for spring break and the break that, that gives our students and our teachers and those that are involved in that, in that world, Lord. Um, we thank you for Academy 4 and the opportunity we have to mentor the kids at Han Meadows this week and for all those that, that are part of that. We thank you, Lord, for, for all the many ways you continue to show your power and your wisdom to us. Lord, we, we, we pray that we will not be people that seek wisdom of this world and not power from this world, but seek that from you, Lord. And it doesn't mean that we don't learn. It doesn't mean that we don't seek knowledge. And it doesn't mean that we don't grow, but it means that we funnel all that through our relationship with you. In this moment of silence, Lord, we offer our own prayers of thanksgiving and our own intercessions on, on behalf of others. We continue with the concluding prayer. 
Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in our afflictions, and defend us from all error, and lead us into all truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.